So be you doers of the word and not hearers only. And listen to what that verse said. Be you doers of the word and not hearers only. If you be doers of the word and not, if you be hearers of the word and not doers, you deceive yourself. Because the idea of the word is to equip us for good works. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for instruction in righteousness so that the people of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Jesus Christ really came into the world to recruit a labor force. People that would do His will. And we today is limited to the Bible. We, what we've done today we have sought a mold God around our own need. And that has limited God. And so what we want to do then, Christian community development, is, is to put God in his proper place. The God of the universe. The God who created all of this. And the God who created us to manage this. God gave this creation to us. And he said to us to subdue it, have dominion over it, and to utilize these resources for his glory. And, and so we have sort of given these resources over to Satan and the devil. And we've given this resource over to the tycoon. And really, we really in the church have become sort of beggars in a world that God gave us to manage and to subdue it. And, and so we have limited God. So what we want to do then is go back to the Word of God and really look at the Word of God. We, this is not, CCDA is not a grand religious social program. CCDA is the gathering of God's people who want to try to live out the Word of God and who are trying to put these biblical principles into practice. And so that's what we want to do here uh, 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 today. We want to, and so open your Bibles then to the little epistle of John. And for the next two, next three days, we're going to be studying First uh, John. Now, First John, First Epistle of John. Now, the let's pray first. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your grace, and Lord, we thank you that we can take this time now to really study your word. And then, Lord, with the idea that we can apply this word first to our own life, and then, Lord, we can then live it out, that it might shape our character, and that we might be better people, and then that we might be created witnesses for you in the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is my burden. My burden right now is that I believe that we are living in a very opportune time in the history of the church. Uh, that in the last 30 years in my lifetime, uh, it was an assumption 
that what was wrong in our society, and a lot of this is right, the assumption was right, that uh, our system, our political, social systems was oppressive. And especially for us as black people, that's an absolute fact. Because where I came from in Mississippi, uh, prior to 1965, the Constitution of Mississippi said, and most of the southern states said, one vote, one person, which means that we was not person until 1966. And since that time, we have thrown off then some of those limitations that the systems had put upon us. But more and more today, as we look at the problem that we are facing today, they are no longer so much system problem, or you still have system problem. Most of the people are in prison. Most of the people are in the condition they're in because of their own behavior. And so we are seeing that most of our problem today is sin problem. And the government is seeing, is beginning to sense this, that we not create programs to deal with them. And now they are beginning to look to what they call the faith base because they see that there is a human, moral, character situation that we got to deal with. There are values. And the way values are established in all societies is by people, religious, and family belief. Now we know in our society that the family is in trouble in our society. And so this is an opportune moment for the church to come back and to live in obedience to God and to be the kind of disciples so that we can shape the values and the character of people. Discipleship is to make us good people. It's to shape our values. Um, so let's go to First John and then see why John wrote this letter and why I decided to pick out First John for our study uh, this year. John wrote the, you, if you say John's first um, letter would be the Gospel of John. And, and what you have in John's whole thought about the character of Jesus, that he was both life, light, and love. And this is, as John looked at it, this is the basic character of God. That God is life, and, and the biblical idea is that God blew into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And so life, John is saying, has been made visible. The life of God, that Jesus Christ embodied the life of God. That's the first thing that John says here. In, in, his, in his gospel, he also says it in 1 John as we get to it. John talks about, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and this life was the light of man. So you're having that one, one, in those two short verses there, you have both life and light. Now this light here he's talking about is the light of intelligence. And that's what we're going to deal with here. here. It's the light of intelligence. So people are intelligent, even though folks don't know God, they're intelligent. That's the light, the light is every person that comes into the world. And, and, and we all have life. Life. Whether you know God or not, you have life. You have life. And so John is talking here about that. And we're going to see then that we, that we have, we also have love, or we have the need for love. We have all those things. And, and so John here is, 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 uh, is talking about that. Now what had happened in John's, in John's writing, John probably wrote the, the little epistle of John, is probably his last, right, John was, the apostle John 
was the pastor of the church of Ephesus. And, um, and now John was an old man, and he has wrote his Gospel of John first, and he's probably have written his, the book of Revelation. And in the book, book of Revelation, he outlined how things are going to end. And now he's writing to this epistle here was written not as a um, uh, an epistle. It was written more like to a family of people. Because, you see, the real church is modeled after the family. We have almost turned the church into an institution, and we're almost managing it and behaving like it's an institution. But the church is modeled after the family. And what God is doing is modeling families. He's building families. That's the one thing that I, uh, I remember one time I was in, uh, uh, it came real to me. I was out in uh, Iowa, and I was at Trinity Church out in Iowa. And, uh, and the pastor of that church is, is here. And I said to him, oh, because you go out to Iowa on a Sunday, they just sort of close up everything and go to church. And, uh, and, uh, and I said to Brother Dan, I said, uh, how many people do you all have in this church here? It was so full, packed. You know, and I saw the thought that come out that morning just for me I, because I was there. But I found out later they do that every Sunday. I mean, that's the way they do it out there. And, uh, and, uh, and he said, we don't count individuals in our church. We count families. I think we have over-individualized Christianity. I think that we in America talks about personal salvation and personal all of this. Of course you are saved individually. But you are saved in order to nurture your family. And not only that, but you are born into the family of God. And so the church is modeled after the family. And so John is writing his epistle here to the family. And he's talking about the family and how the family uh, uh, behaved. Let's get in then to uh, and what was happening in the family uh, here was that in that day, too, that the church had was turning away from God. Now, in, the, in, the, in, in John's John writing, we're going to see it here, that these people had accommodated so much heresy that the church had lost its central message. You, you understand? It was, it was primary. The church was doing like today. It was pretty well serving the individual members instead of being that family within the community. That, see, the church, what we need to understand, that the church is a collective body of people. One individual do not properly represent Jesus. One individual, as they join with other individuals, constitute that body. And we are the members of that body. And to the, to the extent that we can act collectively as a family act, we can then have impact in our community. And, and most of us think that we can be good enough Christians, almost individualistic, to please God or to do the will of God. You can't do that. Because your pleasing of God even depends on the other gifts that other people have within the body that they release in your life. And so all of us need uh, a certain amount of individual Christians releasing their own gifts in our life so that we can grow to maturity. And so if you're thinking that you can be effective just as you and God and your Bible, you are missing it. God is working within the collective, within his body, within this collective group of people, within this community. The church was original, was to be a parish, a parish where people within that parish 
care for each other. Where that they cared for each other, for those who was in the body of Christ, they loved them and cared for them. For those who was not a member of that body of Christ, they cared and loved for them, cared for them. It's really only the Roman Catholic Church in the world that still have a sense of the parish. The most of our reason our churches are not effective is because primarily they are commuters. And so they come to church primarily for their own nurture only. And their own nurture and growth, and whatever that means, becomes the end goal. And so they are coming to church. The end results of our development as Christians so that we can be effective doing the ministry. And the ministry then need to happen at the neighborhood level. And so the church really, really ought to be a community church, a neighborhood church, a church where people know each other. And, and so the whole deal today is putting nice emphasis on bigness and removing itself from being effective within a given neighborhood. And, and so there is a there is a thought, a pattern is, that if our church get bigger, then society is going to get better. I'm not certain about that. I'm not certain that society is getting big, better in these cities where you got churches. Pastor Jake, for instance, in the last five years have gone to Dallas. And he has got about 20,000 members in Dallas. I doubt whether or not Dallas is very much better because they got 20,000 members. Because those people, and I'm not saying that Dr. Jakes is not a good pastor and not a good preacher. I'm not saying that. He must be able to articulate and to say things very nice because all those folks are coming. But as far as the church being impactful in Dallas, and has found a place in Dallas where it is making a concrete difference, I doubt that very much. And how on earth then can you really measure whether or not they are affected? I suspect that everybody is coming there to hear that good preaching and that good music and to go back into the community and live their individualistic life in society without tying that to the neighborhood and the community to make a difference in the community. And so what we want to do, and this is what Christian community development is about. Christian community development is about gathering people together in the body of Christ around a local fellowship and a church where those people are being equipped to rescue the perishing and care for the dying of the people in that geographical era of neighborhood so that we can begin to impact the community. And if we can get that going around the country, we could really see renewal and revival in our neighborhood, in our community. And, and so John is writing his epistle uh, to people who are, who, are, who, are, who are losing the idea of authentic Christianity. And that's what I'm taking. The, I'm taking to you guys today, basically the church have what we call from a theological perspective, have apostated. It is, it is, it, it is not, it hasn't apostated in the sense they don't come together to worship. It has apostated because it has focused itself upon itself. And, and do not recognize the fact that we are stewards of this mission that God has placed this truth and his life and his love in our hands. And that we are responsible for sharing this truth and this love to the end of the world. Let's then go and look at what John is saying here in 1 John. Now, why am I saying all of that? And, and why we are not uh, affected in the world. Let's then read, let me read then uh, what we're going to cover today. Uh, let me read down through uh, verse 4. That'll be as much as we're going to cover here today. And let's listen to John as we read it here. Uh, John here goes on to, look what he says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard with our, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, 
which we have looked upon and our hands have held of the word of life. And now what John is letting us know right here is that Jesus Christ was the incarnated God. Now he says that in his epistle. He said, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. In him was life and this life was the light of man. He says this now. When he, so when he's talking about in the beginning, he's going back here saying what we heard about God throughout all forever. He said what we heard about God, this God has been made visible to the world. That God was incarnated in Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying here. Look, listen to it again. That which, that which was from the beginning... That which we have heard, that which we have seen, which, I, which we have looked upon, and our hands have held of the word of life. And so what John is saying, the life that lived eternally with God back in eternity, that life was incarnated and walked here on this earth. And that life of God was in Jesus Christ. So that Jesus Christ was the eternal life of God. And John is saying now that we touch that life. We have relationship with that life. And this word, this eternal word, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And John is saying we beheld his glory, the only begotten of the Father. So in verse 2, look what he says here. And this life was made visible. And this life was made visible. And we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, was manifested unto us. Now, uh, this eternal life, and what John is getting at here, this life here that was lived was God's life. And when we are born again, God wants to and places in us his life. We are born again. We have his life. And now we are to produce his life in the world. And with the, Now, this life here is affected because this, this God life was affected because this life was lived without sin. That Jesus was the only sinless person that ever lived. So eternal life was lived without sin. We're going to see in a few minutes that God is going to give us this life. And this life is going to be in us. But what's going to handicap this life, since he's going to put this life in you and me, he put this life in Jesus. And Paul could say, I mean, John could say, we saw this life lived out in all of its glory, in all of its beauty. And it was lived out in all of its glory and all of its beauty because it was a life lived without sin. Now, what he's going to do then, this life that's going to be lived without sin, then this life is going to be given, this life, for you and me. As a sacrifice and as a substitutionary death, so that then he can now give us this life, and even though from time to time when he give us this life, we're going to sin. We're going to sin. We're going to sin. But what he's going to do, because he's going to die for our sin, then he's going to be able to forgive us for our sin. Okay. And then, what he's getting at here, then we can live this life effectively. And we can live this life with the joy that he has. We're going we're gonna to see that. We're going to see that. He didn't sin. He that knew no sin was made sin for us. And so John was talking about when he looked at this life and saw it, he saw it was eternal life and he saw it was an abundant life. And Jesus said that to us. Jesus said that uh, while Jesus was living this abundant life, he says, uh, I've come that you might have this abundant life, that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly. And if you can live this life abundantly like I lived it abundantly, 
People will see this good works in your life and they will come to Christ because they will see this work in our life. What's going to stop this abundant life from being lived is sin. But we're going to see here that he has not only died for our sin in the past, but he has made provision for our sin now. And we're going to see then that while we're going to sin, sin do not have to stop us from living this abundant life because we're going to see we can confess that sin and we can go on and live in this abundant life. We're going to see this here as we, as we move through here. Listen to what he says here now, Dan. He says, for, for this life was made visible, and we have seen it, and show unto you that this eternal life, and that's what he, he's calling this eternal life, is, this, is this, uh, this, this life that is to be lived with enthusiasm and joy. Okay, enthusiasm and joy. Because you see, we're going to see this, it is the joy of life is the one that's going to do the will of God. We're going to see that. Abundant life is lived out with joy and, and enthusiasm. We're going to see that here as we, as we move along. Look what he says here. Then John, uh, he's going to conclude here. Let me read these other two verses so we can conclude here. That which we have seen and heard, John said, we declare unto you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse 4, These things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Now, the purpose of my lecture here today is that we might have full joy. Then if we have full joy, we are able then to do the will of God. And that's our work. But it's a, you see, joy is the fuel. A joy is the energy that accomplishes God's will here on earth. You don't do God's will with drudgery. You don't do God's will with sadness. You do God's will with, with a sense of joy and a sense of gratitude. When you recognize what God has done for us, that he's forgiven our sin, he's paid the debt of sin, and we understand that we don't have to live with this sin, that we can confess it. When we understand the depths of salvation, and we could understand what this word salvation means, we then could have a sense of joy. Because the idea of salvation is this, that, that, that we will... Yeah, dead to God and then when we accepted Jesus Christ as Savior he made us alive and then he forgave us for our sin of the past he wiped it away he put it behind our back that we can never remember it again that he will never remember it again and so he saves us from the past but he also salvation has a present aspect to it that he saves us day by day, that he keeps us saved, that, that, that he forgives us and keeps us saved. And then it has another aspect to it. He has provided a safe place for us and a guaranteed place for us throughout all eternity. That means then that this salvation, that we are absolutely secure. Now, that we should no longer live unto ourselves because all that is necessary for our own living has been taken care of. And now we can no longer, no longer should live for ourselves, but we should live for Him. Now we should do that with a sense of gratitude. Our life should be lived in a sense of gratitude of the salvation that God has prepared for us. We are secured in Jesus Christ. That he has provided everything for us. Now we're supposed to live that out with a sense of joy in, in life. Now, what then uh, hinders that joy? What stops us? What stops us then is sin. Is sin. Sin that we don't confess. As I said in my Bible class this morning, I personally believe that a lot of our 
sickness today has to do a lot with with our habits of behavior our inability to forgive because I really believe if we can forgive freely I believe it opens up our life for a certain amount of healing and a certain amount of wholeness in our life but because we can't forgive we can't overcome the problems in our society and I have watched that in people I know I have watched that among people I love. I have watched people who can't get well. And I watched a lot of their not being able to get well is because they cannot give, forgive. And they carry these hurts alone. And every time you talk to them, they are talking about these hurts that other people have hurt them with. And you know, as I live, and I live, and a lot of folks in here know me. You know, I don't allow people to put that hurts upon me. I don't allow people to put that hurts on, upon me. I, I confess my sins when I sin, and then I confess my sin, and I get the feeling that God forgives me because He said in His Word, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and He's just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And He says, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. And so since I believe that, then I, and I won't let you put your sins on me. You know, people go up walking around here trying to tell you, yeah, you hurt me. Well, I want you to forgive me. I want you to forgive me. Please forgive me, will you? Please forgive me. And when I ask you to forgive me and you don't forgive me, it is now your fault. Until you can, it is your problem that you are left to live with. And most people are walking around with other people's problems. When I go to the divorce court, when I go to all of these places, what I see most of the time, when I see these people in the insane asylum, I see these people in prison, and most of these people can't forgive. Can't forgive. Well, you can't be spiritually healed until you can forgive. And so we live. And what is happening in the church, the fastest growing element in church work today is, is uh, psychological counseling and psychological healing. And they are making a big, big enterprise out of this. And, and, and what, it, what I call it is, is that these psychologists and psychiatrists, what they are doing is really making money just like lawyers is making money off of your problems that you self-inflicted with. These psychiatrists and, psych and psychiatrists and all these people, they are making money managing your sins for you. You, 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 you know? You know? And, and and they are and they are calling them now. They are calling them now spiritual guides. <laughs> they, they are calling them now. Uh, you know, they got names for them. And and I got to go see my spiritual guide every week. And my spiritual guide has got to help me. And I've got to confess my stuff to my spiritual guide. Well, I tell you, you need to be confessing that to God, so you can get rid of it. So then he can restore the joy of your life so that your life can be lived with a sense of full, full joy. And look what he says here then in verse 4. And I write these things. Now, this is the purpose of this book. This is the purpose of the whole book here. You're getting that quickly. The purpose of this book is that we might have joy. And let me then define for you what is joy. Joy comes out of our own resolution to be obedient to the word and the will of God. You see, God's word is direction. 
Yeah. Yeah. And so his will is what we are seeking to do. We don't always quite understand that. And so we are seeking to know the will of God. To know the will of God and to do the will of God is everything. I want you to know that. I want you to know that. that should be our daily med meditation. It's whether or not we are seeking the will. Now, if we are seeking the will of God and if we are living within the will of God, then we're going to have the happiness and the wholeness that we need to do it with. Because he said it. Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all these things that we need will be added unto us if we do that. And so what is the, what is the, this joy? This joy then is our desire. Listen to what it says about it. This is where we get our definition from. We get it directly from uh, the word, from the book of Hebrews. It said about Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despised the shame, and to sit down at the right hand of God. Now, I can tell you about the joy. The, the, the joy that he had before him was really the idea that he was coming to the earth, that Jesus was leaving heaven, coming down to this earth, was going to walk here among the sinful humanity, and then this sinful humanity was going to put him to death, that he was going to come into his own world, his own world would be so blind that his own world would put him to death and he would be crucified and buried. And that God the Father would raise him from the dead for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. He despised the shame. And then he went and he seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, where did his joy come from? His joy came from the fact that he came into this world to live in obedience to his father. And he lived that life completely in obedience to his father. And nothing in this world hindered him from doing that. That's what it says in the Bible about those patriots in, in, the, in, in the book of Hebrews. He said, those guys live. They live. They didn't necessarily know what they was doing, but they were living in the complete will of God. And, and so joy, joy then all the time. Listen to this one. The, another, you get another good handle on that from um, uh, Nehemiah. Nehemiah, you know the story of Nehemiah, don't you? Nehemiah went back to Jerusalem in the midst of the poverty, in the midst of the oppression. He went back there and he built the city. He rebuilt the city. And listen to what he says about it. He said it the seventh time. He said, the walls came together and the building was finished because the joy of the Lord was their strength. And so joy has very little to do with happening. Now, when people decide they want to live in sin, then what they got to do then is create all of this happiness in life. And, and, and you can see, and today, entertainment, entertainment is an attempt, it's a misunderstanding of joy. The Christian joy should come from his resolving his own heart that he's going to obey God and that he's going to do the will of God. And then it is sin in our life that traps us up. Let me go and I'm going to finish. Uh, here uh, for today. And then, so we say we have the joy. Now, how then can we have this joy? That's what I'm here for. Because we want to release the uh, CCDA people so they can go back to their neighborhood and their community and be effective and make a difference. And we can set up tutoring centers. We can set up discipleship centers. And we can be nurturing our young people back in the neighborhood. And I'm really, I was uh, uh, somewhere not long ago in a meeting. And here was the, the, the governor and a lot of other folks there. And it was in this meeting and dialogue. And they was talking about the need for, you know, with this economy now. You know, our economy now is at about 3% unemployment. 
And that's almost what you need from job to job. So our economy, we are pretty fully employed. And these people was complaining about not having no workers. And I said right openly before all these people, and I said it before I even un realized what I was saying. I said to them, why don't we open the prison and take those two million people out and put them to work? Well, I know that those people, if they come out, they're going to need nurturing. They're going to need training. And why don't we, as a church, go back to our community and surround these jails and these prisons? And why don't we go back to our neighborhood? At the same meeting, this sheriff who was seated beside of me, he said, John, he said, what we need, we need these halfway houses. We need the churches to go back to their community and to start these halfway houses for these men and for these women. And we go, we go to prisons in Jackson, around Jackson, and you know the growing era of prison now. Is, and this is scary, scary, is these women going to prison. Now that's one aspect of it, but there is something that frightens me more than that. You know the largest death today in terms of homicides in the community is now these men are killing these women. That's a big thing. What we got is cannibalism in our community. At first, it was the women there was being pulled down by the men. And now what we have is these men are now killing these women. And these women being locked in prison. What we got to do, what we, that's our task now. I think we got the economy going. You know, I think we got that going. I think we can produce some jobs, uh, especially we in the urban community now. We're getting a little bit of handle on some of this education. The best thing we can do, yes, we got to support the public school, but maybe some of the best thing that we can do is start some schools, start some little schools in these neighborhoods to produce some more leaders in those communities. But what we really need to do, we really need to surround these prisons and these jails and really begin to nurture those people. And I want you to know that these people are valuable. These people in prison. Do y'all realize the fact that the people who become world changers in society is people who come out of prison? Did you know that? The most effective people in society is people who come out of prison. The people who make revolution is people who come out of prison. And so if we could start getting into these prisons and nurturing these people in prison, and then what we need, you see, is to have these homes for them to come out. Because if they come out of prison, and if they're able to be alone within 90 days and sometime less, they're going to be back in prison. You know why? Because the very nature of prison is this, is to stop you from making decisions. And so when you're in prison, everything around you, that's the nature of having people in prison, is to, is to stop them. That's the worst thing that can happen to a person who has a free will. That is punishment itself. That is hell itself that when you no longer is able to make any decision on your own that you want to make. And when you are in prison, that's the nature of prison, is to stop you from making any decision. And so, when you come out of prison, if you don't have some people there to nurture you and to mentor you when you come out of prison, what you're going to do then is begin to think, because the mind is intelligent, and you're going to begin to think. And when you have to think, you see, everything that you do, you have to do it with some kind of a sense of a precedent. You have to remember how it was done before.
That's the, that's the very nature of making decisions. Is you have to remember. Well, when you've been in prison for five years, and you haven't made a decision in five years, you're going to remember when you get round how you made your last decision. And you know what the decision you're going to be? Is that you're going to commit the same, make the same decision that you made that got you into prison. So what we got to do, you get the idea? I think this is where I want to oh, Hope House. Hope House is on it. We need, we need Hope Houses in every city and neighborhoods in our nation. And a Hope House is a place where we take these young people. And I, it's, it's what happened. If we get these going, you know what's going to happen? The judges, because I meet these judges all the time. And when I speak across the country, these judges come up to me. And they say, we are tired of sending all of these people to prison. And he said, a lot of these people, because of these new sentencing laws, are these three strikes and you're out. He said, a lot of these kids shouldn't be in prison. And so if we had some houses like that, the judges, the next step would be for us, then for us in CCDA, us people who are helping the government to arrive at policy. You, you know, I've been meeting with our Supreme Court justice, or a couple of the justices, and we are talking about this now. We are talking about this whole idea. What would happen then if we would send us these gear, and they could put it at the end of the sentence? That'd be the best way. We could send us these people to these halfway houses. We would send us them to, 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 to six months they got to serve. Six, five months of, the, of that, uh, uh, three months of that is spent in prison. And those last two months are spent in this halfway house. And at that place then, we can nurture those young people. And then we can put them back into life. That should be our task. That's where we as CCDA members need to think about. And I'm thinking about, I'd like to see every community doing that. I would like to see, we might have to take one of the things that we are concerned about is forming these coalitions within cities, where cities, where groups work together. And maybe we should start off by developing first like uh, a house for men and then a house for women because you need this. And, and it would be good if you could develop these houses. And I've saw the success one, the most successful one, are those where they develop them, where men and women are in the same close proximity. I think what Ms. Jackson is doing in Pasadena is absolutely wonderful. Because what's happening there, these, young, these people who are coming out of prison, they're going back either getting their wife and their children and getting back together, but almost every month or so, these people are getting married. They're getting married and they're caring for them. And so we can do that. I think that's the mood. We can, well, then how do you do that? Let me, let me conclude here. Conclude here. How do you then uh, get rid of this sin that that uh, that I don't want to uh, suggest set up an institution here just to manage those people's sin? We're talking about an institution here where young folks are going to come in and we're going to teach them how to get rid of their sin. But we also got to teach them the Word of God. And I find out that these halfway houses that work the most effectively is those where they put those people in the Bible for hours and hours and hours studying the Bible because the Word of God is quick, it's powerful. It, it purges us. It purges us. It convicts us of our sin. Let me look at this now as we close. This then, he says, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. In him is no darkness at all. Now God want us, and we're going to see that now. God want us to, it's time, to, okay. Uh, God want us to walk in light. And in the light here is, the light here is walking in obedience to the word of God. And when we see our sins and confront it with our sins, we confess our sins, 
God forgives us of our sin, and then the light is restored, and we are walking in light. Let me conclude it then. Then he says then, this is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say then we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. Then if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then, this is what he says here in closing. If we say then that we have not sinned in the past, and if we haven't sinned if we don't have this full joy, then he says we lie. And the word of God is not in us. So let me conclude uh, here today. What we need to do is to have this full, full joy. And to live in obedience to God, we need to keep our sins confessed. Keep our sins confessed. Confess our sins to God. And ask God, if go to our brothers and sisters. When we figure out we don't sin against them, go to them and tell them our sins. He said, if we care, if we think we're going to worship God and we discover that we have all against our brothers and sisters, we are to go back and get that right with our brothers and sisters and then come back and give our gift to God so that we can have the joy of the Lord, so we can be effective in our neighborhood, in our community. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time that we could spend together in your word. And Lord, I pray that you would just use your word that your word would really become quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. That your word would pierce uh, to the dividing of our soul and our spirits and the, and the thoughts and the intents of our heart that your word would make. And then, Lord, that we would uh, learn how and learn how to practice, Lord, confessing our sin and confessing our sins to each other, our faults to each other asking each other to forgive us and to live a life with a sense of your presence in us. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name for his sake. Amen.